Hi everybody, this is Moby Parsons, and I'm going to go over a video today that is a patient guide to the Riemann Run procedure. This is a special type of shoulder replacement that is designed for patients who are either young or very active and want to avoid placing a polyethylene glenoid component, which has been associated with some risk of midterm failure. A little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a fellowship trained shoulder surgeon with a subspecialty interest in shoulder replacement. I'm a member of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons and a founding member of the New England Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons and a specialist in outpatient joint replacement surgery. I'd like to uh, credit much of the artwork in this talk and the technical aspects of the Riemann run to uh, Frederick Matson, who was my fellowship director and my mentor in shoulder surgery, also the pioneer of the Riemann run, and Steve Lippett, who has uh, done an incredible amount of amazing artwork uh, over the years, including a lot about Riemann run. And this is referenced in the uh, article here from Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, current technique for the Riemann run in 2012. So. Many of the illustrations in this talk were derived from that. A little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, between July and September of 2020, about 11 shoulder surgeons led by Dr. Matson formed a study group about the Riemann run to discuss differences in techniques and philosophies from a group of experienced Riemann run surgeons. And from these discussions, we've learned that different surgeons may use different techniques and implants, but achieve very comparable results as long as the principles of the operation are achieved. So the content of this talk reflects m much of what I do in my practice, but not necessarily what some other excellent and experienced Riemann run surgeons do. Basic shoulder anatomy, the shoulder is a ball and socket joint. The, uh, the socket is shaped somewhat like an almond here, and it is surrounded by a capsule. The capsule is reinforced by ligaments, and outside the capsule are the muscles and tendons of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff consists of four tendons that help compress the ball into the socket, and the acromion bone, denoted by the arrow here, sits above. The deltoid muscle comes over the side. So a little bit of a, a glossary of terms before we get started. The glenoid is the shoulder socket. The humeral head is the ball that forms the ball and socket joint. The labrum is this structure denoted by the, my arrow here. This is a ring of fibrocartilage tissue surrounding the edge of the socket that helps to deepen it. The capsule is beyond that, which is, which is again, makes the joint watertight and is reinforced by ligaments and the rotator cuff is a group of four muscles and tendons surrounding the joint. Shoulder arthritis involves loss of cartilage between the ball and the socket. As you can see here, there is no joint space in a normal shoulder x-ray. You would see a space between the ball and the socket here. And you can see that there are other adaptive changes such as this large bone spur, also known as an osteophyte. Some flattening of the head can be common. We, we oftentimes will find cysts in the bone, such as this darker area right here. And a characteristic feature is wear of the glenoid or socket. You can see in this picture on the bottom right here, this area where the cartilage has been completely worn down to bone. As said, glenoid wear is a common feature of shoulder arthritis and this wear can result in different patterns of erosion. This picture on the right here is, is the, the Volch classification uh, published in, uh, in 2016, a modification where they added this, what's called the B3 glenoid here. And you can see in many of these uh, scenarios, the, the humeral head will slide off the back of the shoulder socket here and start to result in progressive wear of the back of the shoulder socket. We oftentimes will see A2, B1, B2, and B3 glenoids in patients who are uh, Riemann run uh, candidates. 
And what ends up happening is, is as you develop wear of the back part of the socket, the angle between the face of the socket and the blade of the shoulder changes. It, it, it becomes more retroverted or the angle uh, formed by that relationship starts to point more towards the back. As a result, the humeral head becomes decentered off the back of the shoulder socket. So retroversion, again, is an increased angle between the face of the glenoid here and the body of the shoulder blade that results from arthritic wear. Decentering is when the ball starts to slide off the back. So you can see this midline here does not intersect the middle of the ball, but the front of the ball showing that more of this head is decentered out the back. And biconcavity, when this when this decentering occurs and wears the back part of the socket, you can see it forms a separate concavity in the back here. So there's the native concavity and a second concavity, and that's called a biconcave shoulder. And these three uh, problems here, increased retroversion, posterior decentering, and biconcavity are common features of, of patients who develop shoulder arthritis who may be candidate for the ream and run. We call this the pathologic triad, those three things. And this figure here shows how we can measure decentering of the joint to show what percentage of the ball is actually behind the midline of the shoulder socket because that is one of the features that we will want to correct when we perform a ream and run operation. So again, this is a characteristic pattern that we see and these pathologic changes to the shape and orientation of the glenoid need to be addressed to restore proper shoulder function. If we just resurface the humeral head and we leave it in this decentered position resting in this second concavity, the wear process will continue and patients will have a painful shoulder that will get worse with time. These are different examples of, of arthritic shoulders. And again, this is a plain x-ray here. This is a CAT scan here. And you can see various degrees of biconcavity and decentering. This is a, a shoulder that is very decentered here. This is a shoulder where you can see the angle between the blade and the face here, or the retroversion is very advanced. You can see large bone spurs here. And so each shoulder that we encounter is different in terms of how we can correct the arthritic changes, but the goals are fairly similar as far as what we want to do. In a standard total shoulder replacement, we replace both the ball and the socket. And there's different stem designs uh, on the humeral side, short stems, stemless implants, standard stem implants. And there are different glenoid designs, including a common one called the anchor peg. Um, and, and this one here has some bone ingrowth titanium pegs on the back of it. So there are different uh, uh, implant choices that surgeons have to address shoulder arthritis in a standard total shoulder replacement. The downside of a total shoulder replacement is that these glenoid implants can become loose over time and they can undergo wear and possibly fracture. And all of these scenarios can result in the need for further surgery and revision. This is a classification system uh, come up by Mark Lazarus showing how we measure glenoid loosening over time. And, and essentially what you can see here is that the cement that is used to fix the glenoid implant to the bone eventually debonds and that implant becomes loose. Loosening can occur more frequently in patients who are quite active and place high demands on their shoulder. And for younger patients and even some older patients with uh, a lot of years left ahead of them, it's predictable that this glenoid implant will not outlive the demands of the shoulder and failure will eventually become imminent. If you look at glenoid failure statistics, it's historically quoted as 1% per year, but again, it's much higher in younger patients as these implants are not meant to withstand heavy activity. 
Some studies have shown that radiographic failure of nearly 60% can occur at 10 years, particularly in younger patients. When the glenoid does become loose, it can result in significant destructive changes to the bone underlying that implant. And if you have to go back in and revise these shoulders, it can be difficult because you lose good bone uh, to fix a new implant, and this may require conversion to a reverse shoulder replacement, and it may require harvesting bone graft from other areas of the body or using cadaver bone in order to fill these defects. People have devised other surgical options for arthritis in young patients. One is called the CAM procedure or comprehensive, arth uh, comprehensive arthroscopic management where arthroscopic techniques are used to remove bone spurs and release a stiff capsule around the shoulder joint. This may be uh, an option for people who don't have much glenoid wear, but once you develop significant flattening of the head or, or wear on the glenoid side or decentering, again, the arthroscopy is not going to be able to address some of those pathologic changes. Isolated surface replacement arthroplasty uh, involves using um, surface replacement implants such as this one on the top here or this one on the bottom. These are bone preserving, but again, if we just replace the humeral head without addressing the pathologic changes on the glenoid, we can continue to have problems with retroversion, decentering, and, and glenoid biconcavity that can compromise the results of that. People have tried biological resurfacing using various different tissue patches on the glenoid side, and these have a very high failure rate and have largely been abandoned by most surgeons over time. Finally, fusing the ball and socket together also is an operation largely of historical interest, as most people do not tolerate the lost range of motion that occurs from that. So what is the ream and run? The ream and run is a type of shoulder replacement that involves replacement of the arthritic humeral head to create a smooth round surface, reshaping the native glenoid into a smooth single concavity, recentering the head back into that concavity, and avoiding the use of a prosthetic glenoid implant. So essentially, we are resurfacing the humeral head, but also addressing the pathologic changes on the glenoid side. The Riemann run was pioneered by Rick Matson at the University of Washington, who recognized the propensity toward failure of glenoid components, such as these here. These are retrieved implants in patients who had failure of total shoulder replacements. And he recognized that this was a problem and that we needed better options for younger patients and for patients with very high physical demands who did not want to take that risk. Potential advantages of the ream and run is that it allows unrestricted activity without the risk of glenoid implant failure. And this is very attractive for younger patients where the long-term risk of glenoid failure is high because of life expectancy, but it's also attractive for many older patients who continue to have high functional demands who may also be at risk for potential glenoid failure over time. And in well-selected patients, Riemann run has been shown to provide comparable outcomes to total shoulder replacement. So again, activity restrictions after the Riemann run, there are none. Because the major limiting factor of a total shoulder replacement is the glenoid side. If we avoid use of a glenoid implant, we do not have to place any restrictions on patients who undergo a ream and run procedure. And so we have patients that are power lifters and engage in all manner of sports and recreational leisure time and work-related activities. And again, zero restrictions that we place on these patients once they are fully healed. Key principles of the ream and run procedure. We have to create a single smooth concavity. So again, when we have these biconcave glenoids, we need to create a single concavity for that head to sit in. And we want that concavity to be congruent or to have a matching radius of curvature 
as the humeral implant that we are going to place in there so that there is maximum load distribution over that surface. We want to recenter the head. So when these heads are decentered like this one, where you can see this line does not bisect the middle of the head, but is located in the anterior quadrant of the head, we want to recenter that head so that this line will bisect it. And that tells us that uh, we are correcting the pathologic forces across the joint. We want to preserve maximum bone stock when we do this, so we don't want to remove excess bone in this narrow vault of the, of the native glenoid. And we want to try to maximize range of motion for patients, as many patients are quite stiff before surgery. So again, if we create a single smooth concavity, we can have maximum load distribution over that surface. The, in, a, uh, in a canine model, uh, based on some animal studies that uh, we performed at the University of Washington, we also found that the reaming process may stimulate the formation of a fibrocartilage layer. So here is a reamed canine glenoid here. You can see we've created a single smooth concavity. And over the course of time, you can see this red layer here is a new layer of cartilage that can develop over that ream surface during the healing process. The main indication for a ream and run is moderate to severe arthritis of the shoulder, motivation to comply with a prolonged recovery period, and we'll talk more about this in a bit. Motivation to avoid the risks of glenoid implant failure. No history of inflammatory arthritis. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or other forms of inflammatory arthritis are more likely to have continued problems on the glenoid side and may not be good candidates for this. And it's essential to have a well-functioning intact rotator cuff. So Dr. Madsen says, well-informed patients who desire high levels of activity and who are fully committed to complete the required rehabilitation may be candidates for the ream and run. Who's not a good candidate? Patients who want a quick path to recovery are probably better served by a standard shoulder replacement as they tend to get pain relief earlier. Patients who are unwilling or unable to comply with an extensive rehabilitation program and patients who are unwilling or unable to take an active role in managing their outcome. Other factors that we've noted have been associated with poor outcomes include inflammatory arthritis, as mentioned, smoking, poorly controlled diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, and patients involved in workers' compensation claims or other litigation related to shoulder arthritis. So in short, chronic medical conditions may potentially compromise the results of a ream and run, and these need to be vetted in each case to determine if patients may be a suitable candidate. In general, as far as gender is concerned, the results of ream and run in women have been a little bit less predictable with some higher failure rates reported due to ongoing glenoid sided pain. It's speculated that possibly lower bone density or a higher likelihood of an inflammatory component to the arthritis may be involved in this. But that said, there are some women who may be appropriate candidates. And again, this needs to be vetted on a case-by-case -case basis. How do we prepare the glenoid technically during the surgery? So any remaining cartilage on the front of the glenoid can be scraped off with a curette, which is a surgical instrument that's like a small spoon. And in glenoids with a double concavity or a biconcave glenoid, the central ridge between the two can be removed with a burr to create a single concavity. We then use custom reamers to shape the glenoid. So the reamer is this instrument right here. It's circular and it has cutting blades on it. And the radius of curvature of this reamer is customized to match the diameter of the head that we will be placing on the glenoid side. And the bone is conservatively reamed to create a single concavity here. And you can see that we're not 
we're not overly trying to correct the orientation of this so much as we're trying to create one single smooth concavity. In terms of choosing a head size, again, we have custom reamers for the ream and run, and that's really essential. These reamers have a diameter that's roughly two millimeters larger than the head size that we will choose to obtain optimal coverage of the cut surface of the humerus. Having a little bit of mismatch between the reamer size and the head size allows for nearly conforming surfaces, but some ability for the head to shift on the glenoid surface as it does in a native shoulder. If it's constrained too much, it leads to excessive friction at the joint surface, which can cause further wear. And if there's too much, too much mismatch, you may have point contact without well-distributed load. And two millimeters seems to be a good balance between uh, optimal conformity without excessive constraint. And this is what we do in my practice with our custom reamers. In terms of reaming the bone, Again, we tend to do off-axis reaming here because if we try to overly correct the orientation of the glenoid, you can see to do this would result in significant removal of glenoid bone here. And as you do that, not only do you penetrate through the hard, what's called the subchondral bone, which is good for the humeral head to sit on, but the glenoid narrows as you move inward, and this takes tension off the rotator cuff which then can compromise rotator cuff function. So if there is retroversion due to glenoid wear, we will accept some of this retroversion as long as we can create a smooth concavity, and this helps preserve bone stock. Again, failing to address the pathoanatomy on the glenoid will allow the replaced humeral head to remain in a decentered position, and you can see this will result in point loading and significant stress concentration over this small area of bone. And so the idea of reaming and rebalancing the head is to recenter it and allow this load to be distributed over a much larger surface. The height of the humeral head is also adjustable, so the implant systems that we use may give us different head heights for each head diameter. So you can see this would be a smaller head height and this would be a larger head height. And we can use the thickness of the head to tension the soft tissue. And this is part of the balancing that we do to recenter the humeral head. And essentially what we're doing is we're trying to balance range of motion with joint stability. And there's on-table tests that we can do to figure out what the best head size will be to achieve an optimal balance where we can make sure that the head will remain centered, but we're not overstuffing the joint, causing stiffness and pain. Other techniques that we can use during the surgery to improve range of motion include releasing the tight capsule around the joint. So again, here's this dense capsule in an arthritic shoulder as this becomes contracted as the joint becomes stiff. So we can selectively release this capsule uh, off of the, the labrum, leaving the labrum attached to the shoulder socket. And the degree to which we release this capsule can be customized to each shoulder depending on the amount of stiffness and the pattern of glenoid wear. This is a, uh, a video that shows preoperative planning that we can use before these cases are done. And so this is a CT scan that we can import into a planning software that allows us to look at the shoulder in three dimensions to measure the native retroversion and the inclination, which is the angle in the superior inferior plane relative to the axis of the shoulder blade. And once we have a plan in place for how much version we're going to correct, how to maximally preserve the subchondral bone, we can then transfer that plan into the operating room for surgical navigation. And so the system that I use allows me 
to navigate that plan during the operation by using a computer system here that can visualize the patient's shoulder with infrared trackers. So we can register the patient's anatomy to the CT scan and our instruments then have trackers on them that allow us to orient our reamer according to our preoperative plan so that we can balance creating a smooth concavity, minimizing bone loss, and achieving um, an optimal correction of retroversion. And this provides real-time intraoperative feedback on reamer orientation and depth, which I find to be helpful. But again, not all surgeons use this, and uh, some of this is just based on personal preference. This shows a little bit about what navigated reaming looks like. So this is a tracker that's placed on the coracoid process of the shoulder. We go through several registration steps where we are registering the patient's native scapula with the CT scan on the computer by selecting multiple points around the glenoid. This is showing us that our registration is good. And then this shows us exactly where we want to start our entry point in order to achieve the goals of reaming here. This is uh, navigated reaming here. This is a reamer being placed into the shoulder. And again, using this targeting system, we can orient the direction of our reamer to achieve the optimal correction that we want. Again, as, as far as implant choices on the humeral side, there are several different ones, including standard length stems, short stems, stemless implants, and resurfacing implants. Resurfacing heads have somewhat of a mixed track record. They are the most bone preserving as you do not have to cut the humeral head off. You can see the backside of this is hollow. And so the head is reamed and shaped, and this is really like a thumbtack that is placed over that reamed surface. It does not violate the humeral canal, which is potentially attractive in terms of bone preservation. But if you look at a lot of outcome data, including registry data, overstuffing and non-anatomic placement are more common with these implants. And because the head is not resected, it can be very difficult to expose the glenoid for reaming. There's also only one head height per diameter, which limits some of the options as far as balancing the soft tissues as we talked about. Stemless humeral heads are also bone preserving. In this case, the, the head is resected, uh, which allows better glenoid exposure. And there is uh, no violation of the humeral canal down here, which may be beneficial in terms of blood loss and pain. There are only one to two head thicknesses per diameter, so there may be some limitations versus a stem system. And it is also a little bit more likely to place these in a non-anatomic position or potentially overstuff the joint due to an inaccurate head cut. Short humeral stems, uh, the advantages of these, there's potentially less stress shielding. Stress shielding is a phenomenon where when the stem butts up against the outer wall of the bone here, the bone above that doesn't see stress because it gets transferred through the stem to the bone down in the shaft here, and the bone can decalcify over time. With, with shorter stems that are designed not to fill the entire canal, you can get less stress shielding. They also allow variable head sizes for each head diameter and multiple stem sizes to accommodate different bony anatomy. Uh, because they are shorter, there is a little bit of a, of a potential to malalign the stem. And then finally, standard length stems. The advantages of these, it's easy to achieve secure fixation because they go further down into the bone here. Again, you have variable head thicknesses for each diameter but there is a potential for stress shielding in some systems. And obviously because you're engaging this all the way down the humeral canal, there is maximal canal violation. Factors that may influence the humeral implant decision. Some of it may be surgeon preference. Some of it may be altered 
humeral head humeral shaft relationship such as may occur after an old fracture preoperative stiffness may be a factor so shoulders that are really stiff may favor a smaller head height and so having more head height options might favor a short stem or a standard stem and bone quality so if the bone quality is poor which is often not the case with a ream and run but if it were you may favor a stemmed implant implant for better fixation in the end as long as the principles of the ream and run are met it may not matter too much as long as secure immediate fixation of the implant is achieved and it allows the surgeon to achieve the goals of centering stability and motion some of the causes of of uh, ream and run failure are technical in nature and common ones would include overstuffing the joint so so this is a case here where the height of this head above the rotator cuff is way too high this joint is is really overstuffed here and this is also non-anatomic placement so this this humeral head cut is in a position called valgus and the, 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 the stem of this implant should be at a more acute angle like this. You can see this bone down here was never covered and this bone spur here can still abut the glenoid. This one here was placed way too high. So the insertion of the rotator cuff is, is down along this ridge here. And here the rotator cuff has failed because this implant, which is way too high above that, has essentially bored a hole through the rotator cuff and you can see it's now not articulating with the glenoid at all failure to address glenoid anatomy we've talked about so you don't want to leave your humeral head in the second concavity back here and finally in order to access the shoulder we have to take down the subscapularis tendon in the front of the shoulder and that has to heal and so if that tendon repair uh, re-tears for any reason after the surgery that can be a cause of instability weakness or, or poor outcomes the main goals post-operatively is to protect that subscapularis repair so this this is a picture here showing uh, how we re-secure that tendon to the bone and so this repair needs to be protected while it heals full healing probably takes three months but partial healing probably begins by six to eight weeks. And so the post-operative goals is really a balance between restoring range of motion and protecting this repair because overly aggressive therapy can result in failure of this repair here. And so really what we wanna start focusing on is, is what's called active assisted and passive range of motion immediately following surgery uh, and here's a picture of a patient post-op day one. This is, this is a patient of Rick Matson's, And this shows how good this patient's range of motion is. And this is what's called active assisted range of motion. He had surgery on his right shoulder here, but you can see he's using his left arm to help guide the motion of that shoulder to protect that tendon repair. Recovery from ream and run is a longer process than a standard total shoulder replacement. So patients tend to have more pain for longer after this procedure and so if you look at this graph here this again comes from a study by Clinton et al from from Dr. Matson's data what they found is patients undergoing a total shoulder replacement tend to achieve their maximum outcome by 12 to 18 months after surgery whereas after a ream and run it can take 24 to 30 months to reach the your maximum outcome but in the end the outcomes are very comparable over time. And so the key message here is that patients need to be patient and persistent with the recovery process, realizing that pain relief and restoration of function takes a long time after a ream and run. But the trade-off is you have unrestricted shoulder function once your shoulder is fully healed. And to me, that's a very fair trade over the risk of glenoid failure, particularly in younger patients who may have glenoid failure when they're still young or still very active. Long-term results of the ream and run were uh, reported by Summerson and Matson, and, and looked at a group of ream and run patients that had 10-year follow-up data. 16% of patients did undergo a second procedure 12% of which were revisions for various different reasons. 
the rate of revision tended to decrease with time. And I think this is a key point. As you get further out from a ream and run, the likelihood that it will continue to last goes up. And that is in contrast to a total shoulder replacement where the likelihood of glenoid failure goes up with time. And so what, what they found in this outcome study is that the patients that did not have an early revision had maintained function over time. Disadvantages of the ream and run, it is a longer and harder recovery because the glenoid is not resurfaced. And so it is normal for patients to have a more prolonged period of postoperative discomfort as the native glenoid adapts and molds to the replaced humeral head. There is a 10 to 15% risk of failure due to persistent glenoid sided pain. And if this occurs, patients may elect to have further surgery which usually entails replacing the glenoid at that point. So again, reoperation rates tend to occur in 10 to 15% of patients. Most common reasons for reoperation is stiffness after surgery. And for this, a procedure called a manipulation under anesthesia can be performed or if necessary, an arthroscopic release of the contracted tissue Infection can be a problem, particularly in the younger male patients, and this may require debridement and antibiotic treatment, and in some cases, complete removal of the implant and a full revision surgery. Again, if patients have continued glenoid-sided pain, conversion to an anatomic or reverse shoulder replacement may be necessary. In my practice, this tends to occur within the first two years, and if patients make it out beyond two to three years, the results are maintained, as Dr. Matson has shown. Can it make patients worse? I think it's fair to say that any surgery has the potential for complications and technical problems. Fortunately, these are rare. Uh, if you look at a study by Lynch et al., they found that 6% of patients reported to be subjectively worse after surgery. The main causes of worse outcomes was infection, failure of the subscapularis repair, nerve injury, or persistent glenoid wear. And I think many of these are potentially avoidable with meticulous surgical technique, a carefully structured rehabilitation program, and proper patient selection. I think the key message on outcomes is, is again, failures tend to occur early in the course of follow-up. And this really highlights the importance of patients being willing to commit to a long recovery process. Again, some failures are due to technical issues with the surgery. And I think this highlights the need, if you're interested in a ream and run, to consult with somebody who's an experienced ream and run surgeon who understands these principles and who has custom reamers. Is it right for, uh, for you? I think if you have an arthritic shoulder, if you have substantial pain and dysfunction and a desire for unrestricted activity, if you're willing to commit to a prolonged recovery, uh, then it may be right for you. I think one other way to consider this is that some patients may continue to have mild, manageable, persistent, residual discomfort after a ream and run, but are functionally much better than they were before surgery. And this minor level of manageable discomfort is a fair trade for no risk of glenoid implant failure and potentially sustained results over time. So, I think that's a very important thing to consider is that if you get a glenoid placed and it fails eventually later, you may be worse off at that point uh, than if you just lived with a little bit of residual discomfort. And, and some patients don't have any residual discomfort at all. That's a synopsis. And hopefully you guys found this video informative about the ream and run. This is my contact information here, as well as a link to our website. I'm happy to uh, reach out to uh, respond to any questions that that people may have. And if you come from uh, a geographic area away from where I am in New Hampshire, uh, I know uh, uh, most of the ream and run surgeons around the country and would be happy to assist in uh, 
and helping find somebody that might be closer to your, to your geographic area. Uh, thanks for watching this.